All right, next up, ladies and gentlemen, we have an immigrant. Yes, from Russia, and he came here legally. Can you imagine such a thing? It can be done! He also happens to be the Chief of Staff for Congressman Tom McClinic. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for Igor Berman, please. Everybody, beautiful day, isn't it? Well, folks, I want you to look around yourselves, and it's all right, I don't really need it. I'll speak from the heart. Too windy. Um, folks, I want you to look around yourselves for a second, because what you're seeing is something really special. That might seem ordinary to you, but then again, you've known freedom for all of your lives, so it looks very extraordinary to me. So once again, look, look around yourselves. What you're seeing is the American spirit at work. And here's why I say that. Let's conduct a little experiment. How many here think that President Obama, or uh, by the same token, Governor Brown is doing a good job? Anyone? Not anyone. Wow, tough crowd. <laughs> now, anybody here afraid to say no? No, exactly right. That's the beauty of America. How many other countries in the world allow that? Not many. I didn't grow up in one of them. Let me tell you something. Where I grew up in the Soviet Union, this would have been illegal. This would have been so illegal that every attendee would have been carted off to prison and beaten up by the truncheons of a secret police. The organizers would have never been seen again. And I'm not talking about an American-style prison. I'm talking about a prison with no TV, no library, and no gym. And probably out in Siberia where it's not this warm. So let's just pause for a second and reflect that what's going on right here, right now, is very, very special. It's the envy of the world. And we ought to protect it and we ought to remember and recognize that and never let go of, of that very important realization. Because if we lose it, we'll never get it back again. Now, now, Ronald Reagan, how many here approve of the job Ronald Reagan did? Yeah! Now talk about a real president, huh? And governor. Ronald Reagan used to tell a great story about freedom of speech in the Soviet Union and in the United States. You've probably heard it, but if not, it's worth remembering. He used to talk about a, an American citizen running into a Soviet uh, communist abroad. And let's reflect on something. How many here uh, possess a passport? Yeah, darn near everybody. What does it mean? It means you can pick up and go abroad. Well, when I grew up in the Soviet Union, you couldn't get a passport for a very obvious reason. They didn't trust you to leave because you wouldn't come back. <laughs> Remind that of the folks in that building who think that socialism is the best thing since sliced bread. So, here's the thing. They only let the very, very hardened, battle-tested communists travel out of the country. And this guy did, and he ran into an American, and the American told him, all about freedom of speech in the United States, and the communist says, well, you know, you Americans, you always brag about your freedom of speech. Well, guess what? We have it in the Soviet Union. Yeah, right. And the American says, well, what do you mean? You can't possibly have freedom of speech in the Soviet Union. That's not at all what we heard. Says, look, uh, anytime I have a grievance, especially if it's a significant grievance, well, I can go over to Washington and I can make an appointment and I will wait my turn, but eventually the day will come I'll go into the White House, I will pound my fist on the president's table, and I'll say, look, President Reagan is doing a lousy job, and guess what, I will get away with it. The Soviet citizen's unperturbed, he says, well, pff, big deal, I can do the same in Moscow. I can wait a while, I can go to the Kremlin, I can make the appointment, I can go past all the guards and all the walls and everything else, and pound my fist on the General Secretary's table and tell him, General Secretary Gorbachev, I think President Reagan is doing a lousy job. <laughs> so, so we laugh, we laugh and it's funny, um, but it's also very, very true. Again, we have to respect, we have to understand that if we take our freedoms for granted, freedom is fleeting. 
And on a more serious note, that's exactly what we're seeing around us. Those are the policies that we see coming out of that building back there and out of the Capitol, at least on the Senate side, in Washington. So, you know, we know freedom instinctively. I mean, this is freedom right here in front of us. I got to know freedom a little bit differently. I got to know freedom while living in the Soviet Union. I wanted to share that story with you. It took my parents about 20 years to leave. They were some of the last refuseniks to get out of Russia. The government would not let my father leave. He was a physicist, he knew too much, he presented a problem. So we, we stayed, we fought them at every turn, but we stayed until the government fell apart and any time government collapses of its own weight, well, even the most essential functions are not performed. But up until that point, you know, we put up with regular searches of our apartment. And, you know, we came to take them for granted. Anybody here thinks that, well, you know, if the police come and they search the apartment without a warrant, it's normal? No. We hear stories about abuse, and they, are, and they really grab our attention. They make people come out to rallies. They end up in the newspaper because they're so unusual. How dare the government beat down the door to somebody's apartment? Right? It's un-American. It's unconstitutional. And yet it was commonplace in the Soviet Union because there was no freedom. So we were used to an occasional search. In fact, we were so used to it that sometimes before we would leave, my dad would put a little piece of string between the door and the door frame. You could probably figure out why. You'd come back and either the string was on the floor, meaning somebody's been there, or yet the string was in the door, meaning they didn't choose to come and search this time around. But before we left, before we left for the United States, we went to say goodbye to my uncle in St. Petersburg. When we came back, uh, we saw a result of a search that we've never seen before. Quite frankly, they were afraid. They were afraid we'd smuggle out state secrets. So the whole place was ransacked. Clothes lying all over the floor, bags overturned, boxes opened. Just utter chaos. And I was used to it. I was 13 at the time. I was, you know, not comfortable, but I was used to it. My parents were stoic. They saw, you know, in it yet another manifestation of a disintegrating regime. But my six-year-old brother was absolutely apoplectic. He was clinging to my mom. He was sobbing hysterically. He was just apoplectic. He was really scared, and I think you could understand, you know, he's little. Whole apartment's been turned upside down. So, and I'll never forget what my mother told him. She looked him in the eye. She said, Eugene, don't cry. Don't be upset. It's going to be okay. In just a few days, we're going to America. And this will never happen there. So that's freedom. My mom knew freedom before she ever set foot on American soil. And that's the freedom that you are here to safeguard. So what happens? What happens if we let it go? Well, what did we flee in the, what did we leave behind in Russia in the Soviet Union as that nation disintegrated and we left? Well, we left behind a government that grew big enough to tell us what careers we could pursue, what books we could read, what we could see on television, what we could study at school, which city we could travel to. By the way, you have to take rail if you wanted to go from one city to another, but that's a different perspective. Um, could even tell you how much hot water you can use. Not in the summer, if you're wondering. It was warm enough. We left a government whose 911 system, and by the way, you all know what happens when you call 911. What do you hear? 911, what's your emergency? Well, we heard, how old's the patient? Because if the patient was too old, guess what? Too bad the ambulance just wasn't coming. Sound familiar, right? Yep. Yep. Folks, that's precisely what at stake. Freedom is fleeting, and if we don't safeguard it, we will lose the memory of freedom. And we cannot do that. And by the way, here's the thing. I don't think we will. Look around you. You are here because you believe that we won't either. You know how the left likes to say, well, the Tea Party, they're all about the past. They just cling to the guns and the religion and that ancient, outdated constitution. Anyone heard that before? Yeah. Well, guess what? Socialism is in the ash heap of history. Freedom is our future.
Freedom is our destiny. I believe in it, and if I may be so presumptuous, I think you believe in it too. That's why you're here. And that, and that freedom is a powerful draw. My grandmother was born in 1911, a long time ago, way before the Russian Revolution. And after the Russian Revolution, the communists showed up on her doorstep and they demanded that, the, that, that her family leave the house and turn it over to the Communist Party. It was too nice and it was bigger than they needed. My great-grandfather said, well, no, it's our house. We've lived here for generations. Why would we leave? Well, you know, they didn't have rights enshrined in the Constitution. He was simply taken away, never seen again. The family expelled from their house. <laughs> kind of like eminent domain, I guess, just Russian style. <laughs> well, my grandmother finally came to the United States. She was 84 years old. She spent her entire life in the Soviet Union wanting to get out. She was fully blind. And yet she wanted nothing more than to die an American, because that was the ultimate victory over all the forces of tyranny that subjugated her all of her life. And so she studied English, she studied history, and she passed the citizenship exam fully blind at 88 years old. And that's the draw of freedom. She spent her time in the United States knowing that, you know, she's spent her life with a cassette player learning English because she wanted to vote for the first time in her life, and she did. And she wanted to die an American, and she did. And that, folks, is the draw of freedom. So, freedom will prevail. We will see to that. And if I can leave you with two things. Remember, freedom's been under assault many times in our history, and many times in the history of other nations that have clung to it. Winston Churchill says that he's been guided any time, you know, especially through the, what was called the finest hour of Britain, by a prayer that his aide uncovered uh, that was said at the Battle of Gibraltar. And it was very simple, and I think we should adopt it as our own. Don't fear the result, for either thy end shall be an enviable and a majestic one, or God shall restore our reign upon the waters. And it makes sense. We have to preserve freedom. We will preserve freedom. And if we let freedom go in this country, there is no place else to look. So, look behind you. Governor Brown's in that building. Speaker Perez is in that building. Leader Steinberg's in that building. Where I work, 2,500 miles away. Barack Obama's in the White House. Um, Nancy Pelosi is in the House. And Harry Reid is in the Senate. Well, our victory is repeating the same words that Oliver Cromwell gave to the Rump Parliament in England a long time ago. Commit them to heart because we will pronounce them to these folks as we expel them from their positions of power. You have, you have sat here far too long for any good you have done. It is not fit that you should sit here any longer. You shall now give way to better men. So, so go and let us be done with you. Go in the name of God, go. Folks, God bless you. Stand strong and stand proud. Thank you very much. Thank you. Igor Berman, ladies and gentlemen.